what's going on fellas this is mike d mr double down on you your favorite personal development coach with another episode of black fathers now now dig this man we're going to have a conversation about a topic that is extremely important specifically in the black community and we have an expert who's really doing his part to create solutions to create a platform to create an environment for that solution to actually come into play. And the brother that I have today is my man, Trevor Rozier Bird. And he is the founder and CEO of Stackwell Capital. But more importantly, he's a husband and he's a father. I mean, the brothers went to law school, he's based out of the Boston area. And when you think about one of the taglines of Stackwell Capital, investing made simple to advance black generational wealth. Like when you really stop and you think about that, I told you today we're really going to tap into a conversation that's needed for us and we got the right brother to have it. So fellas and ladies listening to, because y'all tap into what we're talking about, let's welcome my man, Trevor Rozier Bird. What's up, brother? How much, man? I appreciate you having me on. No doubt, man. I, I, you know, I have to work on my cool demeanor. You're very cool in your responses. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's kind of like, you know, like uh, back in the day, you used to talk about Billy D. Williams. You know, let me get a cool Coke Forty Five. You know, you just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got, you got that that young Billy D. vibe. You dig? <laughs> oh, that's a good thing for sure. For sure. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. But um, but yo, before we jump into your story and your journey, man, I always like to start off with shout outs, man, because who are we as brothers without? the wind beneath our wings without our support systems. Give us a few shout outs and then we'll jump into your story, man. Yeah, I would say first and foremost, my my parents, uh, my siblings, my wife, for sure. I would not be able to do what I'm doing right now without my wife, without her support, without her belief in me. Um, you know, she, she makes this all possible for sure. And so um, there have been countless number of mentors and advisors along the way, including the advisory board that we have at Sackwell that, you know, give me the strength to do this. Um, but, but she definitely um, is the one at the end of the day um, and truly is um, such a great life partner. Um, the other people that I just want to call out, uh, and we'll get to this during our conversation today, is uh, we have a group of student athlete ambassadors that are working with us at Sackwell, so about 20 or so college student athletes. Um, and honestly, just like the perspective, the desire to have impact, the, the like belief and aspiration for change and, and their future growth and development is what motivates me every day. Like I'm doing this for them. I'm doing this for more people in our community to have access to opportunities and, and be able to direct outcomes in their lives. So um, I'm motivated by everyone that is listening today, certainly those individuals that we work with and, um, you know, really just trying to do my part to, to create better opportunities within our community. Mm, dude, I'm gonna tell you, man, like you're already on to something. And, and I heard a, um, a powerful quote by a speaker, his name is P.L.O. Lumumba. I think it's Patrick Lumumba, he's out of Kenya. And he stated something in one of his talks and he mentioned that true success is when my successor succeeds. And so when I think about what you just mentioned, especially when you talked about like the student athlete ambassadors, you know, you're thinking about those that are coming behind you that can create platforms, that can create a gateway to others and creating a level of influence to the younger generation. and you're also building with legacy in mind. And it's the whole concept of generational wealth. It's not just right now. It's not about me popping, right? It's about me popping, but then we create a platform and a pathway for those coming behind us to be popping as well. And so I can really, really, really appreciate that, brother. Yeah, I mean, you definitely hit the, the nail on the head for me. Like legacy is everything. And it's not about my own personal legacy. Like. Um, to me, one of the most important things that we're trying to do here at Stackwell and for me individually is to try to make sure that like there are more people that look like you and I that are stepping out here and doing what I'm doing in the future, right? Mm -hmm. Like it should not be the case that, you know, the number of VC backed uh, black, black entrepreneurs is like less than 1%, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's just crazy, right? Um, there's so much talent and creativity within our communities. And I think part of it is, you know, just the environment in which we um, we all certainly live uh, as a society and in our country. But then also, 
a large portion of it is like seeing ourselves in these spaces. And like, I know for me, um, there were a couple of opportunities that I had in my career where I saw very early on folks that looked like me and doing things that, you know, they were leading companies, they were leading major deals, things like that. And, you know, it just dawned on me that like, okay, I can do that too. And so let me start to think about how I can model and shape some of the experiences that they've had and the, the behaviors and leadership qualities that they've developed to, to try to get there at some point in the future. And so for me, like, we start from sort of the end result that we want to ultimately have. Like, yes, we want to impact people individually in their lives and help them build and grow and amass more wealth. But we also want to, to make people know that all of this is possible. Like all of this stuff is within our reach. And I think that's part of the challenge, um, certainly as it relates to wealth accumulation within our community, as well as just professional attainment and, and income quality as well uh, for, that, for, for that matter. Uh, because I think the more that people see, the closer, the closer they have proximity to just the process and how it all works, I think the better equipped that they will be to realize the outcomes that they want to have for themselves. Mm. Dude, I'm, I'm going to tell you, it's interesting because, and this is a, actually a great segue, you know, you have a very keen focus on future and growth and legacy. Um, but then there's this African, pri uh, you know, premise of Sankofa, which means to go back, right? Mm -hmm. So as we think about the future, and as we think about building legacy, I'd like for you to take us back and really tell us a little bit about your background, your, your story, your inspirations, which really led you down this path. Because, you know, like I mentioned in your bio, you know, you went to law school, right? So you have a law degree in your back pocket, but you've created Stackwell Capital to, you know, help to bridge this, this, uh, this legacy or this generational wealth building legacy. Talk to us a little bit about your story, man. What led you up to where you are today? Yeah, so uh, there's a lot there for sure. Um, so I'll, I'll start from the beginning. So I, uh, I'm one of four children. I'm the second uh, oldest, uh, three boys and a girl. Um, I grew up in New Jersey, um, pretty normal childhood. Everything that I did was focused on sports. Um, all I ever wanted to do was play basketball, baseball, whatever. Um, that was my thing, right? And that's where I focused a lot of my time and energy. Uh, ultimately ended up going to, to Boston College where I ran track um, and then BU for law school. Um, but I would say like one of the, like or two of the biggest like determining factors for me in terms of my own sort of growth and development um my my grandmother actually is a lawyer um and so my grandmother at this point is probably 88 89 years old um, and so she is from originally from Newark, new jersey um she as an 18 year old or high school senior uh, got into Howard University, but because of her family's financial situation, was not able to go. And so she got married, had my mom and her brother, um, and basically put her dreams on hold while she raised her children. And around the time when I was born, she went back to college, uh, took her eight years part-time, graduated from college. Then she went to law school, went to Rutgers Newark, um, and she practiced law for the better part of 25 or 30 years, right? And so like in her experience, I saw every single day um, this like notion that if you had a dream and you believed in yourself and your ability to achieve that dream, like as long as you continued to show up for yourself and do the things that you needed to do, that anything was possible. Hold on, hold on, hold on. So this is not your mother, this is your grandmother. This is my grandmother, yes. This is fascinating. So your grandmother, when you were a kid, went back to school and finished college and went to law school when you Absolutely. were a kid. This is your grandmother. So, and, and I want to, I wanted to park there just for a second. We'll jump back into your story. I, I want yeah. folks to realize, because we have guys who listen and ladies who listen who are across the full age spectrum, right? And I hear so often people in their 50s or 60s say that, oh, well, you know, my time is over. Or I've passed my prime or I've done this and I've done that. And you just gave an example of your grandmother when you were a kid going back to college and then eventually law school and then going to start practicing law like that. Yeah. That So do you know how I mean, I know it's, it's not proper to ask a woman's age, so I'm not asking, you know, her. But do you know at what age did she actually start practicing law? She was probably in her 
early to mid fifties when she started. Wow. Again, yeah. that's, that is such a gem. Like that's a movie to me. Yeah. A, a black woman putting life on hold to raise a family. And then once she becomes a grandmother, going back <laughs> and going to law school and starting practicing law in her mid fifties, man, dude, yeah. I know we're not interviewing about, we're not talking about your grandmother, but <laughs> this is, this is so powerful to me. All right. Continue brother. I'm sorry. Yeah, but yeah. like, honestly, that, that seeing her, that meant everything to me, right? Like, um, I, so I was a middle child for the longest time. Um, <laughs> and you know, there's, there's challenges that come with that. That's, oh. that's for another conversation, but like, you know, I had on one hand, this like notion that like, I didn't know exactly where I fit in the world and like, wasn't sure that I was getting all the like focus and attention uh, that I wanted or needed. Didn't think that people necessarily realized, um, you know, the, the value or skill set that I was bringing to the table. And then on the other hand, I, ha I had this example every single day of this person that was like, counted out for mm. lack of a better term about like what society tells you like your path should be. But every single day, she was not willing to accept that. And so I have embodied that in everything that I do. And that is honestly like the, the single determining quality that has enabled me to go on this journey and get as far as I have gotten this far. It's just this unwavering belief in myself that I can do this regardless of what people say. Right. Mm -hmm. And and I have this, you, you hear like athletes talk all the time, right? Like Michael Jordan, like manu manufactured slights in his head right? Mm -hmm. That people thought he couldn't accomplish whatever it was that he was setting out to do. Mm -hmm. Like I have that same sort of mentality and, and thought process as it relates to building this business. Like I know I can do this. I, I know that it can have tremendous impact on the lives of a lot of people that I care about. And I feel like I owe it to myself to show up and prove not only to myself, but to the world that like people within our community are absolutely capable of this. And you need to start to see more value where otherwise people may have, you know, just moved on and not seen it in the past. Man, dude, I'm, I'm, like literally just the, the story of it happening at that stage of your grandmother's life. But then it's like, when I think about legacy or I think about like our children or our next generation, I think it's important for them to, in essence, take the baton where we gave it to them. So like, if I'm running the first leg and I'm giving it to them to run the second leg, they're not starting the race all the way again at the beginning, right? Yeah. And so yeah. when I think about what you're doing now at your age, which, you know, you're not in your 50s, I don't, you're not even in your 40s yet, right? And you're doing right. this, it's like your grandmother was running that first leg to the race and she's passing the baton to you. So you literally have to say, okay, I saw what she did at this stage of life. I don't have to wait until I'm, you know, seasoned and have you know, 20 years on Wall Street to go back and try to facilitate this thing. It's like, no, she passed me the baton now. I'm going to take this thing now. So yeah, I have a law degree and I've done this and I've worked in some of these industries, but it's time for me to go and take this thing and run with it at this stage. And it's like, my, my kids can take whatever I go from the inspirational perspective and run it from that level. And it's just like that escalation of, of growth and development from a generational perspective. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Uh, and I think there's so much there. Like there's there's so much that I saw in my professional career that gave me the basically like the fundamental skill set to know that this was possible and know how to go about executing and achieving this. Uh, but also gave me the confidence to know that like I was ready personally and, and from a leadership perspective. But then, you know, obviously, you know, we're talking about this in the context of, of Black fathers. So I'm a father of three kids, three small kids. Um, we've got a seven-year-old boy uh, and then two daughters. Our oldest daughter is four and a half. Our youngest just turned a year old about a month ago. Wow. Um, and in an unexpected way for me personally, this whole process, this whole journey has allowed me to become the father that I always wanted to be. Ooh. And what I mean by that is much like we're talking about the experience with my grandmother, um, my kids they understand what it is that I'm doing at Stackwell, right? So they understand um, that I am out here trying to do something bigger than myself and why that's important. We're able to have conversations about entrepreneurship. We're able to have conversations about investing in the stock market and, and managing money. And again, my kid, my older two kids are seven and not yet five, right? Mm -hmm. And like 
the perspective and the conversations that I'm having with them. Um, you know, those are things that like, I just didn't even know or wasn't aware of even when I graduated college. Mm. Right. And so when my kids come home from school, uh, my son in particular, every day he runs into my office in this door and he's just like, dad, did Stackwell make it today? Ooh. Like he understands how tenuous the proposition is of starting a company and like really putting yourself out there. And I think, you know, for my wife and I, the one thing, so my wife is Dominican first generation. Um, and so for both of us, right? Like there were decisions that we had to make along the way that we made because it was like, you got an opportunity to go to law school, you do that. Or like you get an opportunity to go and become a doctor. Like you, you owe it to your family and, and to the sacrifices that they made to make those decisions, right? And so as a black male in this country, I always knew that my margin for error was razor thin, right? Mm -hmm. And so because of that, there were just, you know, things that I wanted to do in life that I would have never even thought about doing. Mm -hmm. um, and so for us as parents, like, the biggest thing that we have always wanted for our children is freedom, mm. right? And like, what I mean by freedom is like the sense or the ability to dream and to know that whatever it is that you wanna do is entirely possible, right? And so through what I am doing professionally at Stackwell and through what my wife does um, on, in her career as well, like they are seeing both of us living out those values. And, mm. and being willing to put ourselves out there and be vulnerable and potentially fail along the way because like the journey is what's most important. And I think through what it is that we are doing, they will realize that their possibilities are endless and that they should have the ability to go off and try and do whatever it is that they want to do. Like to me, that's, that's what privilege is, right? Ooh, you're, creating, because, you're creating privilege. Like you're, you're creating privilege but not privilege through the lens. We think most people think of privilege with, you know, like money and stuff, right? You're creating privilege from the standpoint of exposing them to pursuing opportunities. And it's interesting because the way that, and, and we have to start reframing what privilege really looks like. It's the ability or the freedom to pursue opportunities because people, and it was interesting, most people's natural tendency is to avoid failure, avoid issues. Um, you know, it's kind of like that's why scarcity is used in regards to marketing. Or if you think about fear or anger, they're all used in marketing because most people gravitate to fear, scarcity, or anger to make decisions. There's a few small individuals who have had exposures along the way that open them up to understand the value of pursuing opportunity. Right. So, again, for guys that are listening, I want you to pay attention to marketing campaigns, pay attention to television ads, pay attention to things that are out there. Very few things really highlight the opportunity. Most things figure out a way to tap into what your fears are, tap into what you're angry about, or they figure out a way to kind of massage scarcity into the mix. Whereas if you give them your kids exposures and show them and become examples of what pursuit of opportunities look like, you can rewire their thinking to say like, I'm not necessarily driven by those three components. I'm driven by what is the opportunity? And I'm going to step into this opportunity that's aligned with who I personally am. Yeah, I think that that is absolutely true. And, and the notion of fear, I think, is really relevant, just given what we're trying to do at Stockwell. And so, you know, the data obviously shows um, a, a racial wealth gap that is getting worse by with each passing generation, right? Like it was around 7x uh, prior to the passage of the Civil Rights Act. You look at the total population today, it's almost 8x. Uh, and then you drill down into the millennial population, it skyrockets to 17x, right? So mm. if we don't do something about the, the racial wealth gap now, like the future of our community is absolutely at risk. Can, can, so, can, you, can, can you take a second right there? And for those that are listening who don't have, maybe don't have the, the financial understanding of what the racial wealth gap actually means, because when people hear that, it's like, are you talking about, okay, because for a lot of folks who aren't entrepreneurs or whatever, they're just thinking income. Like this is how much I make mm -hmm. versus what somebody else makes. But the racial wealth gap has other components involved that come into play there. Can you explain that a little bit more, man? Yeah, so the best way to think about the racial wealth gap is just looking at the median wealth of black families versus the median wealth of white families. So mm -hmm. uh, today, the median black family has 
uh, their average net worth is around $24,000 as compared to a white family where it's around $180,000. Mm. And so that Delta uh, is about eight times. Um, and so when you get into, like I said, the millennial population, that, that number skyrockets to, to 17X. And, you know, for me, I think, look, I'm not in any way trying to diminish um, some of the systemic and overt discriminatory practices that have colored our history in this country and, and our financial opportunities. But I do fundamentally believe that the uh, financial markets offers an opportunity for us to start to participate in ways um, that will help us grow and amass more wealth over time and close that gap and secure better opportunities for ourselves. And I'll, I'll get into that um, in a little bit of detail. So um, we know fundamentally that the S&P 500, which is the index that tracks the largest 500 stocks here in this country, has produced like an eight and a half percent rate of return every year for the last 30 years on average, which Compare that to your bank account that's probably paying you less than 1%, right? Mm -hmm. Now, we also know that over the last decade, the S&P 500 is up almost 280%. Mm. So you take those data points. Um, and now I'll just give you one scenario. If you did nothing more than invest a dollar a day for the next 30 years in the market and got that rate of return, the net result of that would be that at the end of that 30 year period, you'd have nearly two times more wealth than the median black family has in this country today. Just a dollar a day. Yes. Wow. It doesn't have to be any harder than that. Right. And so, you know, for me, like you mentioned this at the outset, like I, I have spent the entirety of my career as a lawyer and a business person in the asset management and finance space, um, you know, helping to bring financial products to the market, um, frankly, helping a lot of people that don't look like you and I grow and amass a lot of a lot of wealth through the financial markets. And I got to a point personally where I felt like I was sitting on all this knowledge and information about how this process actually worked. And I felt like I had a responsibility and obligation to to share that with more people in our community. Um, because like the fact of the matter is now you take those data points that I just shared with you only about a third of black families are invested in the market today as compared to almost two thirds of white families. So the loss of opportunity to build wealth through the markets is massive based on um, just general participation rates as they exist today. Um, now, obviously we all know that there are a whole host of social, emotional and cultural barriers to entry that keep us on the outside looking in and prevent us from investing. So one of the things that I hear all the time is, you know, look, um, I simply don't know where or how to start when it comes to investing. Um, people feel like they don't have enough money to participate or that they lack some level of sophistication or knowledge and understanding, or just that the stock market is this inherently risky place that's all about buying low and selling high. Mm. And so I know from my professional experience that many of those things could not be further from the truth. And so what we're trying to do at Stackwell is give people access to the financial products and tools and information to help them leverage the stock market to grow and amass a little bit more wealth. Because I think at the end of the day, what that ha what happens as a result of that is that people have greater agency and control to direct outcomes that matter pervasively in their lives. And that is important because at the end of the day, the racial wealth gap is a social justice issue of our time. It directly impacts every other material issue that we care about in the Black community. So you think about things like access to affordable health care, housing, quality education, food insecurity issues, criminal justice reform. All of those things are directly impacted by a person's access to capital or lack thereof. And so if we can start to leverage the markets to, to get a, a, an opportunity to build more wealth, I think the possibilities for us are endless as a community. And I think the last thing and most important for me is unlike other financial products, there are no gatekeepers to the mm -hmm. financial markets, right? So if you want to go and open up uh, a brokerage account, like, and start to participate in the market, like you can absolutely do that. And nobody has any ability to say anything about that. Mm -hmm. And you will get access to the same rate of return as everybody else. And so it's not like going down the street and running into, you know, a loan officer at your local bank who can, you know, say to you, not for nothing, like, I'm just not going to give you that loan so you can go off and buy that house, right? Like, there, no one has any ability to limit 
our outcomes or our future potential to grow and amass wealth when it comes to participating in the market. And that's why it's so powerful. And that's why more people in our community need to start to leverage the markets to, to transform and, and help them change the outcomes that they're gonna have and, and realize um, the financial goals and objectives that they have for themselves and for their families for generations to come. Man, I'm going to tell you, when you just said something, it really hit when you mentioned the whole concept of there are really no limits to entry into the capital markets, right? There's no real barrier to entry. And when it comes to returns, you have access to the same returns that everybody else gets. And see, there's this um, when you're always when you're on the outside, right? And you always view the grass as greener on the other side, right? That, that's just the a natural Com, you know, natural complex that a lot of us have. And it's interesting, I came across a, um, a quote the other day, and it said, the grass is greener on the other side, that's fertilized with bullshit, right? <laughs> and it was it was so interesting, but it makes so much sense, because so many folks who don't understand the market or don't play in the market or who do not have, you know, capital invested. And when we say capital invested, invested, it doesn't mean that you got to have millions of dollars. Like Trevor mentioned before, a dollar a day, a couple of bucks a month, 20 bucks here, you get $50 for your birthday, you get a hundred dollar bonus for something, whatever. It doesn't take a lot. And you get that same return that you invest $100 and somebody else invests 100 million. If there's a 10% return on that, your 100 turns into 110, that 100 million turns into 110 million, right? So it's, it's the same ratios, it just scales up or down depending upon the amount that you put in. And so a lot of, and I would also say, give some insight regards to, in, with regard to like order because, some people think that, okay, I, do I pay my mortgage or do I invest this money in whatever? Do I pay my rent or do I put it on this? You know, because a lot of people think investing is like going to Vegas and it's not. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, I guess order, proper order as far as getting your house in order and investing and where that fits in. But then also talk a little bit about like the concept of compound interest. And because you and I, when we had our private conversation a couple of weeks ago, you know, we really just kind of went back and forth on this whole notion of compound growth and long term growth. And that's the real gem in all of this, not the what's the big play that's going to take me from zero to 100 tomorrow. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I guess a couple of things on that. Um, I think that there is this misperception that like you have to have everything in your financial life completely squared away before you can start to invest. And what I mean by squared away is like people say, well, oh, I have credit card debt or like I have student loan debt. So therefore I can't invest. Mm -hmm. It's not true, right? Like you have to think about um, trying to do a little bit of both in moderation, right? And so Obviously, if you have high interest credit card debt, um, it's important to pay those things off as quickly as you possibly can. Obviously, never advocating for someone to like take money away from being able to, to provide for and, and meet just standard living necessities like shelter, food, all that type of stuff. But at the end of um, every week, month, whatever it is that you're looking at, there is some discretionary amount of money hopefully that's left over, right? And so of that discretionary amount of money, you should be thinking about, okay, how much of this can I use to pay towards my future? And I think future is, is sort of a, a tough concept, uh, particularly as it relates to investing for a lot of people, because I think there's this perception that people view investing as only being about a 30-year process. And while totally advocate for people taking long-term views and preparing for retirement, um, long-term could also mean a year from now or three years from now, five years from now, whatever it is, right? Like, you know, I'll, I'll just give you a story about my own personal experience. So I started investing at 22 years old when I got out of college because one of my friend's fathers sat me down after work one night and was just like, look, um, you know, you need a way to like be prepared to go off to go to graduate school. Um, this is this process of like long-term passive investing and the importance of compound interest. And in that one conversation, he explained to me, it's not about trying to time the market, buy low and sell high. It's about the time that you spend in the market. 
Um, it's not about how much money you make, it's about how much you, money you save and invest over time. And so mm-hmm. through a couple of investments, and I'm not even talking about a lot of money, like mm-hmm. through a couple of investments, um, you know, I let them sit in the market for a year or two before I went to law school. And I was able to pay for almost a full year of law school based on like a few thousand dollars that I invested a couple of years prior. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I think that's how people need to sort of reframe perspectives around this process of process of investing. Like, are you trying to buy a house in a year? Are you trying to go to graduate school? You're trying to put your kids through some sort of program or through school, right? Like whatever it is, whatever's important to you. Um, I think what people need to realize is that you can't get there through income or paycheck alone. Like you need something to help accelerate your growth. And the way that you accelerate growth is exactly what you're talking about, Mike, is this notion of compound interest. So you're in the market one year, like we talked about, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the S&P 500 accumulates an eight and a half percent rate of return every single year. So in that first year, you get eight and a half percent on your money. Now, you know, the next year you come back again, you're growing interest or, or compounding returns on your original amount that you invested plus that 8%. And that's how this process accelerates, right? Mm-hmm. And that's how you truly grow and amass wealth. And so I think the biggest takeaway for me is that we need to get to positions where we are creating for ourselves multiple streams of passive income that are not dependent on us showing up to a job every single day or our own individual labor. Um, I think, you know, there's, there's, I'm sure you got this growing up. I got this for sure as well. Like within the black community, I feel like our parents and and relatives always teach us like, you got to be twice, you got to work twice as hard and you have to be twice as smart to get ahead. Mm. Right. And, and I get that. And I appreciate where that's coming from. It certainly has served me well in my life and in my career. But what I have realized, um, you know, the more that I've been out here is like the people that truly have money are not working very hard for it. Right. Mm. Like their money is working for them. Right. Mm. And so there's the ability to disassociate themselves from what they're doing professionally with like what is driving their accumulation of wealth over time. And so those are the things that we need to be able to, or start to focus on. It's like, how can I position myself and start to accumulate assets that can do just that for me so that I can have the ability to make different decisions in my life. Like I would not be able to have started this company had I not invested early in my life, right? Like the notion that I could quit my job and go off and do something like this would not have been possible without that sort of security that I had created for myself. So um, I think it's important that that people start to, to understand it and see it in those different ways. Mm. Dude, I'm, I'm gonna say you, you dropped the gym and I hope the folks listening did not gloss over it, but you said you can't get there through income or paycheck alone. Like w- when we stop and we think about that, even individuals, and, and see, this is where, again, we have to rethink and understand money. And I think we, in our community specifically, we really have to do a really deep dive understanding on what is wealth, what is money, what are resources, what, what's the reason behind them, you know, understanding assets and liabilities and debt and income, you know, all of those things, because most people grow up with the mindset of, I'm trying to get me a very high paying job. But even with a high paying job, you can't get there with income or a paycheck alone. If you really have conversations with extremely high income individuals, what are they doing with their surplus? They're taking their surplus and investing it into something, whether it's real estate, whether it's securities, whether it's the markets, whether it's businesses, whatever, maybe it's personal growth and development. Like, I mean, I know for a lot of people, they don't see the tangible outcome, but some of the best investment you can do is in yourself, right? And so to that point, it's interesting, that statement that you made, you can't get there through income income or paycheck alone, to me is so powerful. And that's something we have to think about no matter what income level you're on. Listen to professional athletes who make millions of dollars a year. It's like, yeah, yeah, millions of dollars a year, but I need to be doing something with that income. It's not just me living What happens to a lot of professional athletes or what happens to a lot of individuals with a high income that build a lifestyle around the income and do nothing else with that? Yeah. Yeah, no, you're you're absolutely right. And like, I'll be honest, like part of what drove me to founding Stackwell is that 
you know, look, I've been fortunate that I had the opportunity to go to a school like Boston College. I went to law school. So a lot of my personal network is, you know, full of black and brown professionals that, you know, have high paying jobs. And uh, when I look at some of those individuals, it's like, okay, yeah, you have the high paying job, but there's all sorts of pulls on you financially, right? So a lot of times we're one of the first individuals in our families to have gone to college or graduate school or to have a high paying job. And so there's other people in your family that you have to provide some level of financial support to. And I think like that's part of our community. That's what makes us strong. And we should absolutely do those things. But I just, I saw far too many times like my black and brown professional friends that were not able to live lives and, and, you know, grow an amount of wealth that was commensurate with all the great things that they had accomplished in their lives because they had to support their family or, or there was like this notion of like, well, I never had anything growing up. And so now that I'm making a little bit of money, I want to go out and buy like whatever car or whatever bag and like get that. Right. Like, but you got to do all of those things in moderation and understand that you got to, be thinking about your future while also serving like the immediate needs and and being able to to reap the the benefits of your labor along the way. Mm. Fellas, I hope you paid attention. Again, you can't get there through income or paycheck alone. I don't care how high it is. You have to figure out and understand capital. You have to understand wealth. You have to understand these things and these principles if we're going to get to a point of having generational wealth in the Black community. And so, you know, and, and we'll start to wind it up in a little bit because I know you got a hard stop in, in a few minutes. You know, when you think specifically about Stackwell Capital and, you know, where you're going, what is like your moonshot? Like when, you know, if, you know, Mike D can snap his fingers and say, okay, Trevor, what is it that you want? All right, it's a done deal. What is that you know, with regard to Stackwell? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, for me, like, it starts with impact and mission, right? And so we are intentionally focused on delivering a set of products and services that meet the needs of the black consumer when it comes to banking and financial services. Um, we start with investment because I think when I take a step back and understand what the need is within our community, it's like people are asking for pathways to grow and amass more wealth. I know empirically that this is a really um, strong and potential opportunity that we're presenting to people to help them execute against that very objective. But I think the, the bigger thing that we're trying to create in and around Stackwell is this sense of community, right? And so when I think about, you know, part of the reasons why we are in the situation that we're in, it's because there's a lack of proximity to the investing and wealth building process. So we don't have the institutional support systems that many of our white peers may have. We, we don't have access to the conversations or information flow around how this process actually works. And so while I understand that historically, the fact of the matter is technology is a really powerful thing and we should use technology to, to achieve scale and start to share and, and create greater access to information and understanding around how this process actually works. And so you know, having conversations like this are critically important. You know, starting the student athlete ambassador program that we started, critically important because now we've activated a bunch of 18 to 20, 22 year old kids in localized ways to like go out and start to have these conversations that they've all been like desiring and, and you know, putting them in situations to have positive impact, not only in their families, but in the communities in which they live. And so for us, like, our aspiration is to engender an authentic level of trust within the Black community because our goal is to serve the end-to-end -end financial services needs of people within our community in honest and transparent ways to help set them up for greater success in a wealth accumulation. Because at the end of the day, like I said before, with more access to capital, we will have a greater opportunity to you know, have agency and control to direct the outcomes that matter pervasively in our lives. Mm. Ooh, Lord have mercy. If y'all didn't get something from my man, Trevor Rosier Bird, man, y'all just wasn't listening and you need to push 
replay and, and hear this thing all over again because he dropped gems. Um, going forward, if somebody wants to connect with Stackwell Capital, if we want to, you know, connect with and learn from some of the student athlete and, and you know, ambassadors, all of that, how can we do so? How can we learn more? How can we hear about some of these conversations? How can folks get more from you? Because brother, they need to have as, as much as they have folks on CNBC and on all these platforms, earn your leisure needs to call you and the breakfast club needs to call you and all, all these different folks need to have you chopping it up. How can folks get more about what you got going on, brother? Yeah, absolutely. So I, people can start by going to our website. So stackwellcapital.com. Um, you'll get all sorts of access to information there. Uh, I'd also encourage people to sign up for our waitlist uh, and get on for early access to our app, which we'll be releasing later this spring. Uh, we're super excited about being able to, to ultimately come out and serve you all and, and walk along this journey um, with you towards wealth accumulation, because I think that's what it is, in fact, a journey. And um, we are making a fundamental commitment to this community to, to serve their needs over the long term. Um, people can also connect with us on social media. So our handle pretty much across every channel um, or platform is at Stackwell Cap. Um, and so, yeah, that's how that's how people can stay in touch and, uh, you know, certainly look forward to having other opportunities to, to serve the community and, and have conversations like this. Mm, mm. Well, you know, and before we jump off, you know, this is Black Fathers now. So we got to bring this thing full circle as a husband and as a father. How has this journey impacted you personally? Honestly, this has meant everything to me. Um, this is one of the hardest things that I've ever done in my life. And I've done a lot of hard things before. And, you know, regardless of what happens here, um, the things that I will remember most is the conversations with my wife, the conversations with my children, um, you know, putting our kids to sleep at night and like falling asleep in one of their beds and, and having to like mentally and emotionally pick myself back up and come back down here and work mm. to try to achieve the outcomes that I want to achieve with this company. Um, just the, the perseverance to, to pick myself up when, when you have those hard conversations with would be investors or potential supporters that just don't see what you see. Um, all of that stuff. Um, basically what it tells me is that you have to persist. Uh, and you just have to have an unwavering belief in yourself that you can accomplish the, the goals and objectives that you set out for yourself. And so that's what this means to me. This is, that's what I hope my children are getting from this. Um, I hope that, you know, I am making good on the sacrifices that my wife and partner made to allow all this to be possible. And, you know, as long as I can beat those objectives at the end of the day, like that's the most important thing here. Mm, man, it's nothing like it, my brother. And I'm going to tell you, continue doing what you're doing. I mean, your heart's in the right place. Your head's in the right place. You're walking in the right direction. And, you know, what are the, the, um, the alchemist states, you know, as you pursue your personal legend, the universe conspires to help you along on your journey. And I think there's some wind beneath your wings pushing you because brother, you're on the right journey. And I appreciate you. And thank you for sharing with us today. Absolutely. I appreciate you having me on and uh, yeah, appreciate it. No doubt. No doubt. Now, fellas, as always, make sure to follow Black Fathers Now on all social media platforms. Share this thing out and look, reach out to Stackwell Capital. Trevor Rosierberg, you heard this, brother. Smart, dynamic, got, he's doing the doggone thing, right? Um, reach out to him, visit stackwellcapital.com, get on the wait list, follow Stackwell Cap on all social media outlets. And again, if you see this, brother, you know, that, that did you heard talking here, Trevor, Rose, your bird, reach out to him and let him know that you heard about him on Black Fathers Now. And literally, man, encourage him to continue moving forward. Encourage him to keep having those conversations. Encourage him to keep encouraging all of us to prioritize generational wealth. And guess what? We're all going to be great for it all. And so until next time, y'all be blessed, well, and wise. And I'll holler at you. Peace.